<laughs> um, so yeah, I wanted to, to say thank you for having me. It's, it's a real privilege to be here today. And um, as the introduction said, I, I treat sleep disorders throughout the age spectrum. I actually really like family sleep, and I'll allude to a little bit of that in my talk. I see kids, I see adults, I'll oftentimes see a child, and then I'll end up seeing their parents. So it's really um, uh, a very important area, and um, I'm excited about being here. So. I'm going to talk about um, just a couple of sleep disorders in particular today. One is insomnia and one is sleep apnea because they're very, very common. But there's actually many, many sleep disorders. Um, and if I don't get to one that you want to hear about, I'm going to try to leave enough time at the end for some questions. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. And I always like to start with kind of a story or a case or whatever to get people interested and involved. So we're going to talk about Ruth and John. And Ruth is 67. She's a retired nurse. And she has difficulty falling asleep and also early morning wakings for the last month. She has osteoarthritis. She has a feeling of restlessness in her legs when she lies down at night. She feels like she needs to move them. She's also kind of scared and anxious about her husband, John, because John um, has a heart condition, and um, he gasps for breath at night. And um, we're going to start out by talking about Ruth, but then, as I mentioned, I'm into family sleep, couple sleep, so we'll also talk about John a little later. But focusing on Ruth for a minute, Ruth took um, a medication called Zolpidem. It's also called Ambien in the past during a similar bout of insomnia and it helped her fall asleep but then she would wake up after a few hours and not be able to return to sleep and she came to me and said you know I really would like to see if there's a, a better way I don't really want to take medicines I know that they can be habit forming I could fall with them I could have some problems is there anything else I could do so that's 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 Ruth's story and we'll talk about how I um, helped Ruth sleep but before we get there, let's talk a little bit about what insomnia is. And there's lots of different ways to define insomnia, and there's lots of different classifications that doctors and other healthcare providers use, including the ICSD-2, which is the second edition of the International Classification for Sleep Disorders. But you don't need to, we don't need to be that technical. Basically, it's a repeated difficulty, a chronic condition, sleep in initiation, duration, consolidation, or even the quality of sleep that occurs despite having adequate time to sleep, an opportunity to sleep. So if you're burning the candle at both ends and going to bed really late um, and not getting enough sleep, it's not insomnia. It's just being sleep deprived. Um, which is itself another sleep disorder that we can talk about. But we're going to focus today on people who have enough time to sleep but just can't fall asleep or stay asleep or they sleep but the quality doesn't seem right. And to be chronic, we say it has a duration of one month or more. There's also acute insomnia that could occur, let's say if there's a, a death in the family or a new job or a new baby or a new stressor, um, could be good or, or, or not so good. And that would be more acute. But for chronic, we say it has a duration of one month or more. Um, as I mentioned, it's trouble falling asleep or staying asleep. But there are people who sometimes say that the perception of the sleep they're getting is just not good. It's not high quality. It just doesn't feel like they've slept well uh, the night before. And so this is an important uh, category as well. And then the other thing um, to keep in mind is that insomnia can be second to a, secondary to a medical condition. So for example, in Ruth's case, she has arthritis. It can be um, secondary to arthritis. It can be related to um, another condition in neurology. Sometimes patients with strokes or Parkinson's disease can have trouble falling asleep or staying asleep. And we say the insomnia is secondary to something else. And that's important because oftentimes treating that something else can make the insomnia better, but not always. And we'll talk about that a um, little bit later. It's a very prevalent condition. Depending on what definition you use, it's 10 to 40 percent of the population that can have insomnia. And in older adults, it's even more prevalent. Um, being a woman having an age over 65, 
um, also being depressed have consistently been associated with insomnia. And um, other risk factors are not getting enough exercise, perceived stress, these other medical conditions I mentioned, um, having used uh, hypnotics such as Ambien or having a history of insomnia in the past. And this has impact across the lifespan. So to the same extent as depression and heart failure, um, insomnia can impact people's quality of life. What's different is that it's much easier to treat than depression and heart failure. And that's what I want to kind of give you a take home message today at the end of our lecture is there's a lot of ways to treat insomnia and people shouldn't feel like they can't get a good night's sleep. Um, there are many ways to help people with insomnia. Uh, healthcare utilization is greater because it oftentimes leads um, to people missing work or um, being ill in other ways. So um, it's an important area to focus on. And when I think about treating patients with insomnia, what I do in my sleep clinic is I always start with, you know, what's the root cause? And there's three buckets I like to put insomnia in. One is the biological, one is the medical, and one is the environmental behavioral. So the biological might be that there's some neurotransmitter in the brain that isn't working right. The medical might be the arthritis or another medical condition. And the environmental behavioral, well, in Ruth's case, it might be as simple as her husband snoring like a freight train, right? So, you know, the, the issue is a lot of these overlap. So like, where does anxiety fit in? And if you relax before bedtime, is that environmental behavioral or is that biological or medical? So there is a caveat here that everything kind of overlaps, but it is a, it is a good place to start. So I'm going to, if you would let me humor you, since I am a neurologist with one or two slides, just on the basic mechanisms of sleep. Everything else will be very practical, I promise. But I think it's helpful for you to hear what is going on in the field and at the NIH and what are the research advantage, advances that are happening. So people are more and more thinking of insomnia as a state of hyperarousal. We're almost tired and wired at the same time. In other words, people with insomnia are really tired. They want to sleep, but they can't sleep because their brains won't shut down. And what makes the brain shut down? There's an area in the hypothalamus, which is right behind the eyes, called the VLPO, ventrolateral posterior optic area. Again, don't get too worried about the, the terms and all. But there is an area in the brain that projects down to areas in what's called the brain stem. This is the brain stem, and this is the part of the brain that controls our breathing and our heart rate and all those things that we take for granted that we do during the day and night. And it's active at night, too. So these areas normally project to the thalamus, which is a sensory relay in the brain, as well as the whole cortex of the brain. And they turn the brain on, and they stimulate the brain. So to fall asleep at night, effectively, we need this VLPO area to kind of turn off these areas, these areas you might hear of acetylcholine or norepinephrine or serotonin. These areas need to be turned off so that they don't stimulate the whole brain. And when they don't work properly, when this um, hypothalamus doesn't turn off the brain stem, you get insomnia. And there's even animal models where they take these rats who, you know, they have these male rats and they move them from one cage to another so they have to inhabit the cage of another male rat who kind of left all their stuff around. And so, you know, so the new rat's in the old rat's cage and they're anxious and they don't know where they are. And what they found is when they measure brain activity in these rats, they find that these areas are active and these areas are active at the same time. So nothing's getting turned off. Everything's kind of on at the same time. So you're tired and wired at the same time. Um, there's also been um, imaging studies. They're called PET scans and um, functional MRI scans where they show what the brain is doing when we're you know, not in rat models, but in real humans. And they've shown that when people go to sleep, the brain goes to sleep too, to some extent. It never goes completely to sleep, but these regions 
quiet down. And these are regions that are involved in anxiety. These are regions that are involved in, you know, kind of calming down the brain. Well, in insomnia, they, they don't calm down. They're still active. And this may, again, be why patients with insomnia feel like they can't shut their brain down. They're still kind of going a, a, a million miles a minute when they should be asleep. There's also work from the endocrine literature looking at cortisol, which is a stress hormone. And normally cortisol is highest in the morning, and as the day goes on, it falls. But in insomnia, it doesn't fall as far. And this may be, again, why we can't kind of wind down at night if we have insomnia. So these are all markers that show that something is going on in patients who have insomnia. So that's the biological piece. Now, the medical piece is also really interesting. This was a classic study done in 1998 of more than 3,000 patients with medical illnesses. And they looked at the prevalence or how frequently they had insomnia. And they found that patients with diabetes, heart disease, um, other heart conditions, uh, arthritis had more insomnia than the general population. And then they also found that um, a greater percentage of patients who developed hip problems, osteoarthritis, ulcer disease, <coughs> reported new or worsening insomnia compared to those who did not develop these conditions. Now, what was interesting is when they looked at whose insomnia got better, even if you treated the heart disease or even if you treated the arthritis and that condition got better, some patients still continued to have insomnia. So it was almost like something was perpetuating the insomnia. And we'll talk about that um, next, because after we talk about environmental and behavioral, because there is an interesting model going on there where we perpetuate insomnia. And if we can break that, that cycle of kind of setting you up to continue to have insomnia, we can treat, we can treat it. And that's this model. So what it is, is there's perpetuating factors that we'll get to, but what happens when you develop insomnia, this is the model of Spielman, if you hear about it, the 3P model, we're predisposed because, let's say, we're older or our circadian rhythm, which is um, how well we adjust to our environment is not as uh, flexible, perhaps, and this could be genetically, you know, it could be in our genes that modulates that. We have some precipitating factor like, um, as I mentioned, there could be a stress, there could be something um, you know, good or bad that happens, new, a new grandchild, it could be um, a new medical illness, a new medicine, and this precipitating factor, if you're predisposed, causes you to have a few nights of acute insomnia. But then it may be perpetuated if you do certain things. So first of all, if you start worrying about not being able to sleep, you can have it, like this guy who's reading this book in bed. <laughs> or if you start drinking caffeine to stay awake during the day, but then the caffeine keeps you awake at night, or using alcohol at night to fall asleep because it helps calm you down, but then alcohol actually makes sleep worse because you start waking up in the middle of the night as it goes out of your system. All of that can perpetuate insomnia and turn the person from somebody who's having a few nights to somebody who's having more persistent insomnia. So that may be why the people with the hip problems or the other medical problems, um, even after their medical problem was treated, they had gotten into this vicious cycle of perpetuating their insomnia. So that we need to treat that with behavioral and environmental treatments. At this point, you may be saying, you know, this is nice, but why don't, Dr. Mello, why don't I just ask my, my primary care physician to give me some sleeping pills? I mean, this seems kind of complicated to be thinking of all of this, but the reason I would really argue against simply prescribing sleeping pills, and by the way, I give this talk to primary care physicians too, First of all, behavioral sleep approaches work, and in many cases, better than medications, um, because they work on other aspects, on stress reduction, for example, which is there during the day, too. Um, the second is um, 
well, actually, I'm sorry, that is the first and the second, that they work better than medicines, and I'll show you some data in a minute, and they work on these other aspects. And then the third is that they have side effects, not just on the patient, but on everybody. So, for example, um, we'll talk about an Ambien study that came out that showed that women metabolize it slower than men, and if you use the same dose in women that you use in men, they could be at risk for drowsy driving in the morning, and that could hurt everyone, not just the patient. So there are some important implications. So the challenge that we're still facing is the behavioral treatments I'm about to share with you and the handout that's in the back of the room on suggestions for better sleep. How do we do this in a way that works? Some people in this room may pick up my handout and may go to Barnes & Noble or Amazon and pick up a book and you're good, you figure it out. Other people need more help. Um, and this is something that I'm not only excited about in um, adults, but in children as well. I actually, as you heard, have an endowed share in autism research and one of the focuses of our work is to try to get kids with neurodevelopmental disorders to sleep through the night. So we're also trying to figure out how we can work with their parents and teach them these strategies. So it's, it's a very um, important area, but we're still trying to figure out how to do this delivery of behavioral treatments in a way that's effective and cost efficient, particularly in our new healthcare climate. So here's, here's, here's a slide on why you want to think about other things besides sleeping pills. One is, <laughs> You, people do weird things in their sleep when they do sleeping pills, including writing emails. And this was, <laughs> this was actually published. People would go to their computer, unlock their computer, and send weird emails to people. So you can imagine all of my colleagues were very interested in this. Um, the emails were bizarre enough that they got attention, but they were not bizarre enough that people didn't think they hadn't sent them. So people would say, did you send me that email last night about X? And so, yeah, so that's kind of scary. Um, and people can also sleepwalk. They can get out of bed and fall. There are a lot of reports on these um, hypnotics, particularly Zolpidin, which is Ambien, doing this. And then this is the study with the FDA requiring lowered recommended dose in women of the, the drugs because of the drowsy driving in the morning. And they've even shown that um, survival and mortality is related to the use of sleeping pills, that the 65-year-olds who did not use hypnotics um, had much longer life expectancy than the 65 and older who used them. Now, this may be because they're using hypnotics for other medical conditions. It's, they tried as best as they could to control for what we call these other factors. But I think it is a really interesting and important statistic to keep in mind. Okay, so how do we treat insomnia without using sleeping pills? Um, I like to focus on these three different areas, and I'll talk about them in, in, in detail. So stimulus control is, is a fancy way of saying use the bedroom only for sleep or for sexual activity. Do not use it for... Um, reading, do not use it for watching television, do not use it for balancing your checkbook. Um, I had a patient once who came to me with insomnia who is an accountant, and I guess her way of winding down at night was to balance her checkbook in bed <laughs> before she went to sleep. And she woke up thinking about numbers. So um, this is where I need to remember to say that if you don't have a problem with insomnia and you're here for another reason, like you just want to hear about sleep or you have sleep apnea or something, you don't have to worry about reading in bed. You don't have to worry about watching TV in bed. It's okay. The only reason to turn the TV off or move it out of your bedroom or read a book somewhere other than your own bed is if you have insomnia and if you've in a way conditioned yourself to not fall asleep because then that that TV or that book or, or that checkbook will remind you of doing other things besides sleeping. That's what stimulus control is all about. And that's really important because people will come to me and say, I read and I relax and it works and I fall asleep within 10 minutes. I'm like, don't change it then. It's only if you have insomnia, okay? So that's stimulus control. Sleep restriction is, um, and the related tactic of delaying bedtime means that, you know, if you go to bed at 8 o'clock at night and you're really not tired until 10 o'clock at night, it's okay to wait. 
a lot of times people feel like they need to get a head start on the night, particularly if it takes them two hours to fall asleep. So they go to bed extra early to make sure they're going to be able to fall asleep. But actually, it's the opposite. If you delay bedtime until you're really tired, you'll fall asleep quicker. And then you can always back it up. Because if you're in bed and you can't sleep, what happens is then you start thinking about things, right? You start ruminating, and then you start conditioning yourself not to sleep. So I try to help people find the best bedtime. It's actually hardest in my um, patients who've got young kids or in the kids themselves who have to get up for school at a certain time. But you know, if you have the luxury of not having to be somewhere at 7 a.m. in the morning, think about going to bed a little later and just making sure you wake up, though, at the right time so that you're not you know, sleeping too late. So having a regular bedtime, regular wake time can really help. Um, relaxation techniques. This can be anything from yoga to meditation. We'll talk more on the next slide about that. So, and, and then sleep hygiene. And this is where the avoiding caffeine, alcohol. The iPads and these um, devices can be very stimulating. What's nice about some of them, like the iPads and the Kindles, is you can do a light dimming feature. And that's really good. But remember that bright light can stimulate the brain. It, it suppresses our natural levels of melatonin. And also um, just you know, focusing. Be careful what you're doing. For me, doing emails not only means getting bright light, but also learning about things that maybe I can't control at 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock at night, and I can only deal with the next day. So I try to turn my email off you know, early so I don't worry. But um, so sleep hygiene, physical exercise can be very helpful, particularly um, not too close to bedtime. If it's too close to bedtime, it can be stimulating. But earlier in the day, it can be great. And then cognitive therapy, identifying and changing stressful and distorted sleep cognitions that make insomnia worse. Um, and that's a mouthful, but what it really means is, is if you are up at 1 AM and you're trying to go back to sleep, it means telling yourself that it's going to be OK. You're going to get through the next day. You'll be a little tired, but you'll get through the next day. And not worrying so much about not being able to sleep that you, know, you can't get back to sleep. So that's when you hear cognitive behavioral therapy, it's kind of this plus a combination of these other things. And this was one study looking at midlife women and how exercise helped. This is a book I love called Say Goodnight to Insomnia. It's drug free. Um, and it uh, talks about uh, these techniques in detail. And this is the study that the author of that book did where he compared cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, what I just described, to um, Zolpidin or Ambien. And he actually found that the CPT worked a lot better. This is the um, changes in how long it takes you to fall asleep. And, and people were falling asleep a lot quicker because these numbers are higher with the CBT than they were with the Ambien. So um, it works. It works. It's safe. Um, these are some other techniques you can use. I loved mindfulness, um, being in the here and now, accepting what is. This is a book you can think about using to help. Um, this is uh, techniques about how you can relax at night, another really good book. Um, I put the balloon in, like one of the meditations is you take all your problems from the day and you put them in this balloon and then you watch the balloon go off into the distance. I like this stuff. I know it sounds sort of touchy-feely, but I feel like it works. It works for me. Different things may work for different people. There's a gentle yoga series for sleeping well through our Vanderbilt Center for Integrative Health that you might um, want to explore. So I, I do think these, these have a lot of merit. And then um, tapering hypnotics, people always say to me, if I'm on sleeping pills, how do I get off of them? And what I tell your physicians is the following. First of all, put something into place, like I just talked about. And then pick one day of the week. You know, Maybe it's Saturday. And you cut your sleeping pill in half. You don't stop it. You cut it in half. And then you pick a second day one week later, You know, hopefully not adjacent to Saturday if you pick Saturday, but another day like you'll do Saturday, and then the next week you'll do Wednesday. And then each week you pick another day until you're taking half of your sleeping pill every night. And then you can start the process again by taking away the sleeping pill one night a week until you're completely off. 
Um, so back to Ruth. I actually started her on a medication called gabapentin or Neurontin because of her pain, her restless legs, symptoms where she felt like she had to move her legs at night. Um, and she did very well on that. We eliminated her caffeine, limited her alcohol use. She started exercising. And she's doing well, but there is a missing piece, which is John. <laughs> So John is her husband, and he has heart disease, and he stops breathing, and he snores heavily, and um, he thinks he's fine. He doesn't realize that he's doing this in his sleep, but in the morning he feels like he hasn't slept. He wakes up with a dry mouth and a sore throat, and he has sleep apnea, and what happens in sleep apnea is very simple. The tissues of the airway with age, with increased weight, with genetic predisposition, because I'll see young people who are not overweight, and are not older, but they still have apnea, and it's because um, they've inherited this from their families. And this is the open airway, this is the closed airway, the tongue falls back. Um, when we're awake, we can control our airway. When we go to sleep, it can block. And there are lots of heart complications, because what's happening is every time we block our airway, our body says, whoa, this isn't good. And we get an adrenaline response, and we wake ourselves up to breathe. We don't remember waking up necessarily, but we briefly wake up, we go back to sleep, just enough time to tighten the airway and breathe, but then when we go back to sleep, it happens all over again. So we're putting out a lot of adrenaline, a lot of stress hormones every time we wake ourselves up to breathe, and this takes a toll on the heart and the lungs. We're also sleepy the next day because we keep waking ourselves up to breathe. And then our spouse is, of course, very anxious, uh, as, as Ruth is, by all of this. And then other complications, so, so I mentioned sleepiness, drowsiness. Sometimes people can have problems with their memory. The memory is really interesting. I've had people come to me who feel like they have, they're developing um, Alzheimer's, but they really aren't. They're just not sleeping well at night. And when we treat the sleep apnea, their level of concentration and memory oftentimes improves. With that said, there's a really interesting literature that's being developed on Alzheimer's showing that patients with Alzheimer's who have sleep apnea, um, it may accelerate the process, and if we treat the sleep apnea, we could potentially um, mitigate. Now, I, this is a big claim, and I, I, the big word here is potential. We have to do the clinical trials to know, but I think it's important to realize that sleep apnea is in the mix of risk factors along with um, high blood pressure and heart disease that can contribute to memory problems and, and other conditions. Um, and then headaches, irritability, feeling grouchy during the day. These are the symptoms people can have at night. We don't always get the, the apneas. If the bed partner is sleeping soundly, we may get none of this or we may just get the snoring. If somebody's snoring during the night loudly and they're sleepy during the day, I have a high suspicion for apnea, especially if there's no other reason they should be sleepy during the day, no meds that they're on or, or um, other conditions. And we, we can screen um, for sleep apnea. There's a stop, bang screening tool. It's very simple. It's just eight questions. Do you snore? Are you tired? Um, are you obstructing at night, which is something the bed partner would report? Is, do you have high blood pressure? Is your body mass index over 30? This is a weight-height ratio. Is the age over 50? And is the neck 17 inches or, or larger in men, and, or 16 inches or larger in women, and being male gender? Um, I wanted to mention we do our sleep studies in hotels. We have the Marriott um, in downtown Nashville, which is a 10-bed lab that started in 2003, and the Hyatt in um, uh, Franklin, which started um, in 2008 in the six beds. They're both accredited. We do all ages. We do all conditions. Um, this is a sleep study, just to give you an idea of what we do in the lab. We measure brain waves, which is EEG. We measure airflow. Um, you can see here that there's effort to breathe in these channels. These are um, over the belly and the chest, but this goes flatline on us. This is airflow. Um, and we can measure uh, at the end of this apnea that there's an, an arousal, that there's a lot of activity. And it's hard to see on here, but the oxygen level is falling as well after the event. So we can measure this in our lab. We can, 
put together, I mean, this just kind of gives you, this is one patient showing over the course of the night, they had all these apneas, which are complete stoppages of breathing in blue, and hypopneas, which are partial stoppages of breathings in red. I just showed you one, but this is what they look like over the whole night. Each of them is a tick mark. The oxygen fell into the 70s. We want the oxygen to be 95 to 100. And then we applied CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure, and you could see how the oxygen came up, and they had fewer and fewer of these events. So. Um, uh, CPAP is an interesting thing. It's, it's a pressurized machine. You're using air, not oxygen, just air, to put into the upper airway and keep the airway open. And this is what it used to look like. And you could see why people didn't like it very much, because you're opening up the back of the throat, but you're wearing this big mask. You look old. It's, it's, you look like you're in the hospital. So there's been a big emphasis. <laughs> I'm making CPAP attractive, and this is um, the nasal air device, which is just a nasal device. And what I thought was really funny was about a year or two after this came out, this one came out. <laughs> <laughs> and um, being interested in family sleep and couple sleep, this really appeals to me. Um, so. We can measure, by the way, we can measure how well you're using the CPAP with a little chip in the machine, so you don't even have to come back in for sleep studies. We do the initial studies to diagnose and titrate, and then we follow with these chips. Weight loss and exercise can sometimes help, but one of the challenges with sleep apnea is you're not, you're tired, you don't want to exercise, you tend to eat high caloric foods, it even changes your metabolism when you have sleep apnea. So it's not a great treatment to try to lose weight. It's more helpful to get on the CPAP, lose the weight, and then not have to use the CPAP. So I'm a big advocate of the CPAP. It's, it's again, it doesn't involve pills. It's just um, using the air to splint open the airway. There are these mandibular repositioning devices that dentists will make, and you wear them in your mouth. They're oral appliances. And they have been shown to work for mild to moderate apnea, but not severe apnea. So depending on what the sleep study shows, we can see how severe it is, how frequently somebody stops breathing, how low their oxygen goes. Um, and I'm just going to end, and then I'll take questions. So, um, so John was diagnosed with apnea, treated with CPAP, did very well, and Ruth is sleeping more soundly at night, is not waking up with John snoring. Actually, the CPAP provides a level of white noise that's soothing. And they're both feeling much more alert. They're able to spend much more time on activities they enjoy. So um, I'll uh, stop there, and I appreciate your attention, and uh, thank you. So we have about 15 minutes for questions. Yes? Could you address restless leg syndrome? Yes. So restless leg syndrome is just like it sounds. It's a restlessness in the legs where you need to move um, your legs. It's the sensation of I need to move. It's worse at night. It's worse when you sit or lie down. And it's helped by moving or rubbing. So people will oftentimes get out of bed and jump, you know, move up and down, or they'll walk around, and that really makes a difference. It's treated with, well, the, the underlying conditions, we have to look for an iron deficiency. That's very common. So making sure that um, there's not a problem with low iron. And then the treatments are oftentimes um, some of the same drugs we use for Parkinson's disease. Um, as well as gabapentin, as well as clonazepam. So there's a bunch of different medicines that we can use, and they can be very, very effective um, for restless legs. And it, it can either keep somebody from falling asleep, or they can have leg kicks in their sleep that can wake them up. Yes? Cramps in the calves are also very common, and we have to be careful because sometimes they, they sound like restless legs, but they're really cramps. And they will respond to either calcium supplementation or quinine sometimes. So it's important that um, you know, we differentiate them from restless legs, but they can certainly contribute to pain. They're, they're in that kind of medical bucket of things that contribute to pain at night or discomfort that prevent us from falling asleep. Uh, we'll start here. Um, my gerontologist was talking about not taking things like Tylenol PM because of the 
Yeah, so the question is, um, Tylenol PM has Benadryl, and, and this uh, lady was told, you know, maybe don't use that. And I would agree. I mean, I think Benadryl is okay for a short period of time if you have really bad allergies or whatever, but I think there are better drugs right now for allergies um, that we can use, some of the non-stimulating antihistamines. And the concern I have, too, with Benadryl is that over time you become tolerant to it. So you're taking it, and it's not helping, but then when you stop it, your sleep becomes worse. So I would try to avoid it for more you know, than a few days if you use it at, at all. Um, and ta you know, the, the medicines that I talked about. I don't want to make it sound like we never use sleeping pills. Occasionally we do. We might use them in the short term if, if there's an acute insomnia or for people who just need help jump-starting these behavioral techniques, um, or if there's a medical condition. So for the restless legs, we'll certainly use medications for that. Um, I like using gabapentin. I have no conflict of interest with, with gabapentin makers. I like it because it is relatively benign and it helps some of these medical conditions. I will occasionally use Zolpidin or some of the other meds, but I'm very careful to use very low doses and try to use them for a short period of time. Um, I'm glad you brought up melatonin. Melatonin is also a really um, helpful medication sometimes. It's, it's, we make melatonin in our bodies. It's a natural substance. In fact, I was mentioning it's suppressed by light, which is why you have to be careful with the iPads and the Kindles and all. But um, we make it in our bodies, and um, it's available over the counter. The most important thing is, A, be sure that um, if there could be a medical condition, you get it checked out. That's why I always say, you know, use these over-the-counter aids in conjunction with your, um, your primary care doctor because you want to make sure you're not missing a medical condition that's treatable, like restless legs. The second thing is melatonin, believe it or not, can interact with other medicines like Coumadin. So you have to be careful that your doctor checks it out and makes sure that the melatonin isn't going to interact with one of your other drugs. So those are my two caveats about using melatonin. And then just try to use a brand that's reputable. We used a brand called Natural, and again, I have no conflict of interest or or commercial involvement with them. It's N-A-T-R-O-L, it's purple, and they have it at Whole Foods and at uh, Walgreens and Walmart. We use that in our study of kids with autism who couldn't sleep with a lot of success, and the Food and Drug Administration allowed us to use it in our study. So I like that brand, and I, I recommend it. It's called Natural. Yes? Tell me again what the danger is. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll, I, I, no, no, you go ahead and then it will do. I'll answer her question next. It's okay. Tell me. You want? Yeah. You want me? Yes. Okay. Tell me again, what is the problem with using a very, very low dose of Ambien frequently? Okay. In some patients, there's no problem with using a very low dose of Ambien frequently. However, in some people, we have complications, side effects like the emailing, the getting out of bed and falling, sleepwalking, um, in the morning being drowsy when they get on the road. And for those reasons, I always start with something else. Like, let's talk about your sleep. Let's talk about your caffeine. Let's talk about alcohol intake. Let's talk about what time you're going to bed. Let's talk about exercise. Because if I can avoid using a sleeping aid in the majority of my patients and limit it only to a small number of people who are less likely to have those symptoms, it's a good thing. Um, with that said, we sometimes use it. And people will come to me and say, I've been on X drug for 20 years and I've done really well. I'm not falling. I'm not sleepwalking. I'm not having any problems. I'm awake in the morning. Um, my response is often, go with it. Don't change the variable. So I'm glad you brought that up. You had a question? Yeah. Yeah. Doing what? Oh, well, the question I would ask about the Sudoku is, is it calming or does it stimulate you? For me, 
I get really frustrated with it. <laughs> but if it, if it calms you down, anything. I mean, I'll, I'll do the same thing with, when I talk to my families of kids with autism. Is, you know, the book stimulating or is it calming? Is, is the, so anything you do that you can say, gee, I'm unwinding, I'm forgetting about the day, I'm putting all my problems in another bucket, I'm getting ready to transition to sleep, then the Sudoku is a great thing. On the other hand, if you start feeling like it's getting your brain going and winding you up, maybe not the best thing before bedtime. Does that make sense? Okay, right behind you. A couple of ambient questions. Yes. And you said really low dose. What's a really low dose? Um, well, the FDA is now recommending 5 milligrams in women. It, I'm sorry, 2.5 milligrams in women. The, it comes 5 milligrams and 10 milligrams. So, uh, of the regular and 6.25 milligrams and 12.5 milligrams of the um, slow release. There's a regular and a slow release. Slow release is supposed to be like a time release that helps for a longer period of time because it's released gradually over the night as you sleep. Um, they're recommending that women take half as much as men, so half of a 5 milligram rather than a full. Which means you have to cut off the Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The other question related to that, I'm kind of like that rat that couldn't sleep in the new cage. <laughs> Is there a big disadvantage in taking it just when you're away from home? I mean, That's a good question. So the question is, if you only have insomnia when you're away from home, is it okay to take medication? I think the answer is probably yes. You'd want to take the medicine before you left and make sure you know that it worked and you didn't have a weird side effect, particularly in a new place. You wouldn't want to be getting out of bed and walking around. But I mean, I think if that is a concern and you've tried all the other things and you know this is a pattern for you, it's reasonable. What I want you to do today is I want you to leave with a healthy understanding and skepticism for these sleeping aids. I want you to know that there are alternatives. I want you to know what the risks are. Um, I don't want you to feel like I said never, ever, ever because you know we, we, they are effective. It's just that there are lots of issues and concerns with them and I want to make sure you know that there are other ways um, and whenever I prescribe a medication, I never do it in a vacuum. I always do it with all the things I mentioned about the hygiene and the relaxation and everything else. Yes? How about the herbal stuff over now? Right, so herbal stuff. I would just say be really careful because just like melatonin and some of the other um, St. John's Wart, for example, have effects on medications that people are taking. So you just have to be sure, A, it's a reputable company, and B, that it's not going to interact with one of your medicines. And that's where I would either go on the internet and look, or go talk to your uh, physician, or do both. Yes? What about if occasionally using trazodone? Right, same thing. You, occasionally using trazodone, I would put that in the same category as occasionally using you know, zolpidem. I think it's OK. I mean, I think trazodone also helps depression. so. You know, again, it's one of those situations where you want to try to use something that's helping something else if you can. Yes? Can having stressful dreams every night reduce insomnia? Can having stressful dreams every night lead to insomnia? You know, I don't know if it can lead to it, but I think the stress that's coming out in the dream, that may be the um, outlet for the stress, and then the stress leads to insomnia. So I'm, I think if you have stressful dreams, it's an indicator you might want to do something to relax more, you know, up the relaxation to, to try to see if you can, can change that. Yeah. And then people can be so, you know, stressed by what they might dream that they're afraid to go to sleep. That's the other problem we'll sometimes see in clinics. So I think working on the stress. Yes? Right, so occasional use of Ativan. The concerns I have with Ativan, which is a, it's called a benzodiazepine, it's like Valium, Clonopin. The, the, the problem I have with Ativan over Zolpidin or Trazodone, and it was actually, those medicines like Zolpidin and Ambien were actually developed as alternatives to, to Ativan. Um, they have the extra risk of 
higher dependence, meaning you get used to it and then you can't get off of it, um, more falls, and also um, they can make sleep apnea worse because they can make the upper airway more um, floppy. So that's why in my big book of things, I kind of put like gabapentin up here if I'm going to do a sleep aid, followed by zolpidin or trazodone, and then I put at the bottom the drugs like Ambien, with that, I'm sorry, Ativan. With that said, Ativan, Klonopin, Valium, I'll consider using them in somebody who's got a high level of anxiety because they are very good for, for anxiety. But I also can couple that with um, these relaxation techniques, and I try to get patients off of those as quickly as I can. Um, yes, you are next. Yeah. You. Yeah. Naps during the day. Naps are okay as long as they're not too late in the day because what happens as the day goes on is we get this kind of drive to sleep. Something builds up in our systems and says, oh, you're ready to go to bed. And um, as you, when you take a nap, it abolishes it. When you take caffeine, it abolishes it too. So if you take a nap too late in the day, then you're not ready to go to bed that night. So the idea is a nap is okay, but not too late in the day. And I, I say the same thing to you know, my families with kids, is, is if you're taking a nap at 4 or 5 in the afternoon, it may prevent you from falling asleep. But if you take a nap more like 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock, it may be okay. Other questions in the back? Yes. Huh. Yeah. Well, that's great. I, I, I would just, I would say t turn off the whole phone. Because I'll never forget my husband. <laughs> One day we, we could sleep at late because the kids had some sort of, they changed the school start time for that day. But he didn't like keep his phone coming, coming on at 6 a.m. So the, these texts started rolling in. I could have killed him. I mean, it was just like, <laughs> so, so I think turning off our phones is OK. I think um, your, your observation is very well taken. Um, here, uh, let's do two more questions, your, yours and yours. Yeah. Yes, so restless legs is um, four things. Difficulty, where you feel like you have to move your legs. They feel funny at night, like there's something crawling up and down your veins. It's like an aching feeling. And you move them, they feel better. And it's worse at night and worse when you lie down. It's treated with oftentimes the same drugs for Parkinson's, these dopamine drugs, or with gabapentin or with clonopin. And um, it's associated with low iron, so you want to make sure your iron levels are good. And the last question? What about these, like, these herbal remedies, like putting lavender under your pillow? Right, anything? right. I mean, yeah, I think that's all worth trying. I think the big thing that I mentioned earlier is if it's, if it's an herbal remedy that you take orally, be careful that it doesn't interact with any of the medicines that you're on. But I think... Um, I think that stuff, I think those ideas are wonderful. Yeah, they work. Thanks again, you're a great audience. I love all the questions.